Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurophysician from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very common clinical topic, exam oriented topic and the disorder which we commonly encounter hemiplegia and paraplegia hemiplegia paraplegia the weakness localization the indispensable concepts hemiplegia and paraplegia will be most useful to medical students especially mbba students md general medicine md pediatrics and other courses like neurology and neurosurgery higher specialty courses not only medicine it will be useful for dental nursing and physiotherapy for that matter any health professional who is concerned with the diagnosing and treating patients so very common and commonly encountered persons with diseases in the hospital the hemiplegia and paraplegia, the weakness localization, the indispensable concepts. Here we go. Hemiplegia, paraplegia and localization of weakness. What is weakness? Weakness is a reduction of power in one or more limbs. Plegia implicates severe weakness and paresis indicates less severe weakness. Today's topic hemiplegia and paraplegia. Hemi means it refers to weakness pertaining to one side of the body. Paraplegia weakness pertaining to both the legs and quadriplegia weakness pertaining to all four limbs. But to understand hemiplegia, paraplegia and weakness localization, we need to understand a fundamental concept upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. We need to understand upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron so as to understand hemiplegia and paraplegia better. So what is upper motor neuron? What is lower motor neuron? How are we going to differentiate between upper motor neuron lesions and lower motor neuron lesions? And how is this going to help us in approaching a person with hemiplegia or paraplegia? Upper motor neuron. Upper motor neuron is the corticospinal tract or permanent tract which starts in the layer 5 of the motor cortex, the bed cells. It descends through the subcortical white matter, internal capsule, goes to the midbrain pons at the level of the medulla oblongata. About 80% of the fibers cross over to the opposite side and goes to the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. So corticospinal tract, pyramidal tract understand is very very important to understand hemiplegia and paraplegia. So corticospinal tract or pyramidal tract originates in the cerebral cortex, layer 5 of the cortex bed cell, comes down in the internal capsule where they are close together, comes to the midbrain pons at the level of the medulla oblongata, it crosses over to the opposite side and goes to the anterior horn cell. The entire body is represented on the cortex on the opposite side. But the representation is not according to the quantity, it is according to the quality. So the representation is most for the fingers and the face because we use these muscles quite often. So face, arm, trunk are on the lateral surface. When it comes to the medial part, we have the leg area. The leg area is predominantly supplied with the anterior cerebral artery. The other parts, the lateral part of the cortex is predominantly supplied by the middle cerebral artery and the occipital cortex is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So upper motor neuron basically has got two components. One is the corticobulbar fibers coming from the cortex and going on to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei very important it has got nothing to do with the sensory whatsoever so it goes to the third nerve fourth nerve fifth nerve sixth nerve seventh nerve but does not go to the eighth nerve eighth nerve is purely sensory nerve does not go to the ninth nerve goes to the tenth eleventh twelfth crosses over 
among the trigeminal nucleus it goes only to the motor part of the trigeminal nerve so the cortico spinal tract or the pyramidal tract coming from the cortex to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei we call it as the cortico bulbar tract the pyramidal tract coming from the cortex going right up to the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord we call it as a cortico spinal tract so upper motor neuron has basically got two components cortico bulbar fibers which go up to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei and the cortico spinal fibers which go up to the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord then we have the lower motor neuron lower motor neuron is is that part which comes from the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord as the radicals becomes the peripheral nerve neuromuscular junction and muscle this is the lower motor neuron what comes from the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei as the cranial nerve is also lower motor neuron so again lower motor neuron there are two components one the cranial nerves second are the peripheral nerves coming from the anterior horn cells root peripheral nerve neuromuscular junction and muscle so very very important we need to understand this to approach a person with hemiplegia paraplegia or weakness localization we need to understand what is upper motor neuron what is lower motor neuron so from the cortex to the anterior horn cells is the upper motor neuron anterior horn cells to the muscle is the lower motor neuron so what are the differences between these two how can we localize upper motor neuron lesion if there is an upper motor neuron lesion there is no atrophy there is no wasting of the muscles if at all if it is there there will be minimal disuse atrophy by and large it's normal whereas in mean, lower motor neuron lesion there is severe atrophy in fact it is almost all bones there is no muscle or fat classic example is motor neuron disease or poliomyelitis which affects the anterior horn cells severe wasting there is no muscle mass at all no fat at all only bone severe atrophy you see in lm and lower motor neuron lesions whereas no atrophy in upper motor neuron lesions fasciculations in upper motor neuron lesions there are no fasciculations fasciculations are involuntary muscle twitching we see fasciculations only in the lower motor neuron lesions anterior horn cell disease what we call as canon's law of denervation supersensitivity when the anterior horn cell is partially denervated it becomes supersensitive to its chemical namely acetylcholine and therefore it starts throwing impulses spontaneously without voluntary effort and therefore there are muscle twitches so fasciculations we see in lower motor neuron lesions because of canon's law of denervation supersensitivity the tone the tone is spastic in upper motor neuron lesions spastic and hypertonia so what is this hypertonia and spasticity tone is the resistance offered by muscles to passive movements if the tone is increased in anti gravity muscles flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb or initially it is difficult to overcome then it becomes easy to overcome what we call it as clasp knife spasticity so we have spasticity or hypertonia in upper motor neuron lesions where the tone is increased in anti gravity muscles flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb and clasp knife whereas in lower motor neuron lesions it is flaccid hypotonia the distribution of weakness the cortico spinal tract or pyramidal weakness got a characteristic proclivity of muscles it affects the abductors and extensors of the upper limb and flexors of the lower limb so the weakness is seen more in the abductors and the it is more seen in the abductors and extensors of the upper limb and therefore the person flexes it is more seen in the flexors of the lower limb so patient extends so you can see the classic circumduction gait because of the weakness of the extensors and the abduct abductors and therefore increase in tone in the flexors and weakness of the flexors and increase in tone in the extensors and therefore they have the classic circumduction gait they flex the upper limb extends to clear of the ground they walk like this which is known as circumduction gait the weakness in lower motor neuron is segmental for example if c5 is involved only the c5 innervated muscles get affected like biceps infraspinatus rhomboids deltoid and supraspinatus the muscle stretch reflex is very very important because the very objective sign of demonstration there is hyper reflexia in upper motor neuron lesions whereas there is hypo hypoactive in lower motor neuron lesions and then the babinski sign probably the most important clinical sign 
in upper motor neuron lesions babinski said is present in lower motor neuron lesions it is absent having understood the basic concepts of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron now we can confidently approach a person with hemiplegia and paraplegia so what are the organs or the or the parts of the nervous system which can get affected in the upper motor neuron so cortex can get affected cerebral cortex internal capsule can get affected brain stem can get affected spinal cord can get affected so if it's an upper motor neuron lesion the lesion has to be in the cortex internal capsule brain stem or spinal cord if it is a lower motor neuron lesion the lesion has to be in the anterior tonsil or the spinal root or the peripheral nerve or neuromuscular junction or muscle now how do we localize these individual parts of the nervous system so first let's analyze the upper motor neuron and then go to the lower motor neuron lesions upper motor neuron lesion cerebral cortex when the cortex gets affected the pattern of weakness is hemiparesis if it is a middle cerebral artery face and arm is more involved if it is a anterior cerebral artery involvement the leg is more affected and what are the associated signs if there is cerebral cortex involvement other than weakness other than hemiparesis they can have hemisensory loss because parietal lobe also is involved they can have gaze preference front life fields area number 8 will push the eyes to the opposite side and therefore if it gets affected the eyes will move to the same side hemiplegia is also on the opposite side so they'll have gaze preference to the side of the lesion they'll have hemianopia because optic radiation travels in the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe so if the parietal lobe gets cut off they have quadrantopia inferior quadrantopia if the temporal lobe is cut off they'll have superior quadrantopia then they can have aphasia the speech centers are in the left side of the cortex the cortex where the speech centers are situated we call that as dominant cortex in more than 90% of the time the speech centers are situated on the left side we call that as the dominant cortex so they can have speech deficit if the left side of the cortex namely the dominant cortex gets affected they can have apraxia inability to perform learned motor activities despite motor sensory coordination comprehension being normal so they have difficulty in performing learned motor acts like ideational apraxia idiomotor apraxia limb kinetic apraxia if the dominant cortex is involved or they can have dressing apraxia and constructional apraxia if they have non dominant cortex being involved then if the non dominant cortex gets affected for example right parietal lobe they will have left hemi neglect they will completely neglect left side in fact if you ask them to draw the clock with the numbers on it they put all the numbers on the right side they do not go to the left side if it is severe and if you pinch on the left side they ask whose hand you are pinching so much so that they deny the existence of the illness anosognosia so if all these associated features are there then it is a cortical lesion classic examples are infarction and hemorrhage and extradural hematoma and subdural hematoma this is all we need to know about this cerebral cortex suppose if the lesion is in the internal capsule they will have again have heavy paresis but here the fibers are so condensed together so they will have a dense hemiplegia face arm and leg are equally affected unlike the cortex where the middle cerebral artery face and arm is more affected and anterior cerebral artery where the leg is more affected in internal capsule it's a dense hemiplegia where face arm and leg are equally affected and usually the artery which which causes the internal capsule to get affected is anterior choroidal artery a branch of internal carotid artery classically they'll have hemiplegia hemiplegia and homonymous hemianopia so the other associated features are hemisensory defects and homonymous hemianopia because the visual radiations also go go very close to the posterior one third of the internal capsule the cortico spinal tract the sensory fibers and the visual fibers are more in the posterior part of the internal capsule the classic lesion is again infarct what we call as lacuna syndromes very small infarct usually it is because of the increased age and hypertension and this is about internal capsule then the brain stem can get affected mid brain pons and medulla oblongata so what is the classic pattern of weakness arm and leg is involved face the lower part gets involved if the lesion is above pons but if the pons is involved the seventh nerve is involved so both the upper part and the lower part on the same side is involved so if the lesion is above pons 
the lower part of the face on the opposite side is affected but if the lesion is in the pons the upper part and the lower part of the face there's a weakness of the upper part and the lower part of the face on the same side what are the other associated features if the third nerve fourth nerve in the midbrain or the sixth nerve in the pons is involved they'll have double vision if sixth nerve is involved lateral rectus is affected they'll have double vision on looking at far off objects if third nerve is involved, they'll have double vision on looking at near objects because of the medial rectus involvement. And if there's a fourth nerve involvement, they'll have vertical diplopia. There may be facial sensory loss if the fifth nerve is involved and facial weakness if the seventh cranial nerve is involved. If eighth cranial nerve is involved, they can have vertigo because vestibular cochlear nerve is involved. The balance is lost, they can have vertigo. If 10th and 12th nerves are involved, they'll have dysphagia, dysarthria and hoarseness of the voice those they cannot swallow they cannot speak well they can have hoarseness of the voice if cerebellum is involved because the cerebellum is also supplied by the pica post inferior cerebellar artery or ica anti inferior cerebellar artery or superior cerebellar artery coming from the brain stem they can have ataxia if cerebellum is involved the reticular activating system also is condensed in the brain stem so they can present with loss of consciousness they can have Horner's syndrome if sympathetic tract is affected. So basically they'll have weakness, depends upon the lesion. If the lesion is above pons, so a human type of seventh nerve palsy, lower part of the face on the opposite side is affected. If it is pontine lesion, upper part and the lower part facial weakness on the same side. The associated features are what I just enumerated. And the the examples of brainstem involvement are the infarction, hemorrhage and multiple sclerosis. Yeah, the last of the upper motor neuron lesions is the spinal cord involvement. When the spinal cord is involved, there could be quadriparesis or paraparesis depending upon the level of the involvement. If the lesion is the mid cervical region or above, they will have quadriparesis, upper limbs and lower limbs because C5 and below gets affected. But if the lesion is lower cervical and thoracic, only paraparesis, L1 below. So it depends upon the, depending upon the site, there could be quadriparesis or paraparesis if the spinal cord is involved. What are the associated features? So when the spinal cord is lost, since all the fibers are so close together in the spinal cord, when there's a lesion, all the sensations below the level of the spinal cord are lost. They can have bowel involvement, bladder involvement and the reproductive function involvement. What are the common disorders associated with spinal cord lesion? It could be an extraneous compression like a cervical spondylosis or an abscess, epidural abscess or it could be immunological like multiple sclerosis or transverse myelitis or it could be infectious process like tuberculosis and AIDS or it could be nutrition like, like vitamin B12 deficiency causing subacute combined degeneration. So these are all the parts of the nervous system which can be affected if it is a UML lesion, upper motor neuron lesion. Now we will see the lower motor neuron lesions where the lesion could be in the anterior horn cell, spinal root, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction or muscle. If the anterior horn cell gets affected, there will be localized weakness. There will not be any sensory loss if there are anterior horn cell disease. It is purely motor, there is no sensory loss. And there will be atrophy and fasciculations there will be severe atrophy and fasciculations because it is lower motor neuron type anti cells is involved the classic examples are ALS amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or spinal muscular atrophy where only the lesion is confined to the anti cells or poliomyelitis which affects only the anti cells next is a spinal root from the anti cells we get the spinal root the weakness is the radicular pattern of weakness. The weakness is confined to the root. The associated findings are they can have a dermatomal sensory pattern and the radicular pain increases with, with compressive lesions. And the pain also increases by, by other forces like coughing when there is an excess intraspinal pressure. The usual lesions which cause a radiculopathy are the disc prolapse or Gullenberry syndrome. Next is a peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy is length dependent neuropathy. The distal parts are more affected than the proximal parts because it is length dependent. So nutrition has to travel a lot of distance 
So when the nutrition is insufficient, the distal nose parts get affected, then proximal, then it ascends and then slowly becomes more proximal. So an axonal type of peripheral neuropathy causes a length dependent neuropathy where the distal parts are affected more than the proximal parts. Whereas if it's a demyelinative neuropathy, it's a length independent neuropathy like Goulet Barry syndrome. So if it is a length dependent neuropathy, like an axonal type of neuropathy, the distal parts get affected more. Glove and stocking type of sensory loss, where we have weakness more in the feet and then the hands. As the sensory loss ascends to the knees, then only the fingers get affected because it's length dependent. Very important point. If the person has got weakness or sensory loss coming up to the thigh and above, but still he says there is no environment of the upper limbs, it may not be organic. Because it is length dependent, the moment the weakness or sensory loss ascends to the knees, the fingers should get affected. Very important clinical point. So they will have distal weakness, feet more than the hand. They will have a usual symmetric loss of weakness. They will have distal sensory loss, feet more than the hand. Usually it is graded and symmetrical loss. As I said, it is length dependent. So it is graded more severe sensory loss in the feet, less severe sensory loss in the knees and still less sensory loss in the thighs. The classic examples are metabolic like diabetes mellitus. One of the common cause of peripheral neuropathy in the entire world is diabetes. So any person who comes with peripheral neuropathy, always we need to think of diabetic neuropathy. Toxins like alcohol. Alcohol is a very important and common cause of neuropathy. Neurodegenerative like charcot Mary tooth disease or vitamin B12 deficiency, the nutritional vitamin B12 deficiency is very common. So these are all the causes of peripheral neuropathy. Now let's come to the neuromuscular junction, the prototypical disorder of neuromuscular junction is myasthenia gravis. So they have fatigable weakness. Morning they are alright, but as they start working, they become weaker and weaker with the passage of the time. Fatigable weakness is the most common symptom and a classic finding in persons suffering from neuromuscular junction disease, myasthenia gravis. Usually it involves the ocular muscles and therefore they'll have ptosis and double vision. But sparing of the pupil because Neuromuscular junction disorder like myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder of skeletal muscle whereas pupil is a smooth muscle. So they can have ptosis, drooping of the eyelid, they can have double vision but pupil is not affected in myasthenia gravis because myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder of skeletal muscle, not smooth muscle whereas pupil is a smooth muscle. Very important clinical point and they will not have sensory loss, the associated body they will not have sensory loss, they will not have any reflex changes. Classic example is the immunological disorder, myasthenia gravis. Now we shall come to the last of our discussion, muscle, muscle involvement. Muscle involvement, the weakness of muscles are usually in the proximal muscles. So they have difficulty in getting up from squatting position. They have difficulty in climbing upstairs. In fact, persons who have, who have got proximal muscle weakness, they have a classic sign known as Gower's sign. Classically, we see in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Since they cannot get up from squatting position, they climb up on themselves and get up. This is known as Gower set. So proximal muscles are involved in, in a muscle disorder. They do not have sensory loss. And again, the reflexes are diminished only when the myopathy is very severe. Otherwise, the reflexes are also not diminished. There is no sensory loss. They can have pain if it is an inflammatory disorder of muscle. The classic examples are degenerative changes like Duchenne, degenerative disorders like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or inflammatory disorders like poly, like dermatomyositis or, or polymyositis or polymyositis, toxic like ethanol and steroids, alcohol and steroids and metabolic like hypothyroidism or hypokalemic periodic paralysis and congenital like central core disease. So we have the degenerative Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, we have inflammatory like dermatomyositis and polymyositis, toxic like alcohol and steroids and metabolic like hypothyroidism and hypokalemic periodic paralysis and congenital like central core disease. So if we know all these basic concepts, the indispensable concepts, we can approach a person with hemiplegia and paraplegia and localize the weakness confidently.
I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture as much as I have enjoyed delivering the lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.